this Sunday morning we are teaching on the doctrine of predestination. We teach on many doctrines that people hate so much. We teach predestination. And God has got a family that he knew before the world began. He hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. Paul wasn't including all the vessels of wrath. He was only talking about the believers at Ephesus in Ephesians 1 and 4. And he goes on to say in verse 5, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ unto himself according to the good pleasure of his will. People say, why does God do that? Why does he choose one and not another? The Bible says it's according to the good pleasure of his will. That's what Isaiah 46 and 10 says. He says uh, he, that God has declared the end from the beginning and from ancient times, everything that's not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. God says, My will, my pleasure will be done. And he says the same thing throughout the scripture, Psalms uh, 110.3, My people shall be, thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. God has a people that will be willing to come to him, in Psalms 115.3 says, Our God sits in the heavens, and he hath done whatsoever he hath pleased. He does what he wants to do. He's God. People say, well, why would God do that? Have mercy on one and not the other. Well, he says, Who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing form say to him that formed it? Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay? of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor Jacob and another unto dishonor Esau because that verse in verse 21 of Romans 9 is talking about verse 13 where the scripture says Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated before either one were born, before either one had done any good or evil. Everybody that hasn't read Romans 9 needs to read that because God said he's got vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, and vessels of mercy, which he hath the fore prepared to glory. Now everyone sitting in this room, everyone in the world, right where you sit, you are either a vessel of mercy, and you are fitted for destruction, or you are a vessel of mercy, which God hath a fore prepared, that word of fore prepared, Pro etoia mazo, P R O E T O I M A Z O. Pro etoia mazo means to fit up in advance. You are either a vessel of wrath or you are a vessel of mercy that God has fitted in advance to be one of His righteous people. And you say, How can I know that? You will know that because God will cut in your heart and cause you to desire to be righteous and live godly and live holy before him. And that will not be a mere walk down the aisle to so-called accept Christ. You cannot accept Christ. The Bible plainly states that. You have to have a new birth that you have nothing to do with. When Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again, and that word again is the word anothen, A-N-O-T-H-E-N. That's the Greek word. I'm putting the Greek words on the board. For those of you that don't know what I'm doing, uh, the Greek, the original New Testament was written in the Greek. All you have to do, we've got some people that had not been here, all you have to do is get you a Strong's Exhaustive Concordance. It has a Greek dictionary in the back. It has a Hebrew dictionary in the back. And when you're going to look up a, a, a word out of the Old Testament, when you look the word up alphabetically, it'll have every time that English word is mentioned in the Bible, and you look up the number to the right of the word in the respective dictionary in the back, and you can find out what this means. Later on, as you advance... You can get an interlinear Bible, and that is the original Greek text on the top line, and right under it is the English right under it. Now, I'll teach you how to use this, use all of them, but you've got to come here on a regular basis to find out how to use the Bible and how to look up these words in the original text. You cannot trust the English language. It is a harlot language. It does not meet the text of Scripture. You cannot... You cannot translate it correctly. In fact, 
The King James Bible is not the inspired Word of God. Now, I use the King James Bible. It's not inspired because we had no English when Jesus was alive. English is only a, about a little over a thousand years old. They spoke Greek and Hebrew and Latin, and the New Testament was written in the Greek. You have to go to the original text to find out what the words mean. You, I, one of my favorite words, I guess the first thing I say to somebody out in public, when I sit down in a restaurant and some girl waits on me, and they'll say, well, do you want to drink a cocktail? I say, well, I can't do that. I'm a preacher and people come in here. They'll see me. They'll jump all over me if they're my sheep. And I can't do that. Besides that, I kind of teach things other people don't teach. And sometimes they'll say, like what? I say, like the Greek text. Like the word prayer. Do you know what prayer means? And they'll say, well, well, yeah, it's, I, and they'll kind of mumble around and fumble. And prayer is the word I pull out before I pull anything because that's a word that everybody thinks, the Pentecostals, the Charismatics, the Baptists, all think, well, prayer, you just pray for this person over here to be healed and they'll be healed. Pray for that guy to get a job and, and you pray for this. My mother needs a new car and uh, this guy down here needs this and I got friends that need help and we pray for them that they'll have what they want and they'll get feeling better. That's not the meaning of the word prayer. Prayer is the Greek word P-R-O-S-E-U-C-H-O-M-A-I. Prosuchomai, that's the word whether anybody likes it or not. That's it. And it comes from the word pros. Pros is our word pro. It means for or toward. And the word UK, E-U-C-H-E, UK means to will or desire. Prayer means to will or desire oneself toward the will of another. Isn't that amazing? Jesus said, when you pray, pray after this manner, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Isn't that what he said? And then Jesus goes to the garden of Gethsemane, uh, his last prayer to the Father before he gets to the cross, and he says, Father, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, thy will be done. Huh? You mean he says that and it's sticking us in the face and we're saying, God, now I'm t telling you, you, you heal this guy and that guy. And the charismatics or the people that believe in faith healing will say, well, Jesus came down from the mountain after preaching his sermon on the mount in Matthew 7, 8, uh, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And he comes down from the mountain in Matthew 8 and 1 and he meets this leper and this leper... And Kenneth Copeland will say, he received his healing. No, he did not. The leper said these words. If thou wilt, if you will it. You're God, you can make me clean if you want to. That's what he said. He didn't say, I receive my healing. When you pray, you pray, thy will be done, don't we? Do I know the will of God for my life? No. I just know He wants me to live righteously and godly. But as far as ordering Him around about what car I need to drive and the house I need, whether I need to be well or not, I don't know. Maybe He needs to keep me sick to keep me humble before Him. Paul said, I have a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations. He said, God has revealed to me, and I've written 13, 14 books, maybe, one more or less, of the New Testament, and lest I be exalted above what I should be exalted of through God's revelation, and I should be lifted up in pride, God's given me a thorn in the flesh. Now, it's been argued what the thorn in the flesh is, and nobody really knows. Now, in the Galatia, among the Galatians, Paul says in Galatians, the fourth chapter, he tells the Galatians, you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me when I was with you, and you didn't despise my affliction. And then he says, I write to you in big letters in another place, and then Luke has to be a stenographer in another place. So some say that Paul had a bad eye problem. 
Whatever it was, Paul said, God wanted me to have that, and after I asked him, notice Paul did something he tells us not to do. You can find Paul's sin in the Scripture. He, just, he said, I besought the Lord three times. He didn't say, I prayed. Boy, it's real easy for me to say to you, pray thy will be done, and then I get in trouble. I'm going, oh, God, get me out of this. He's, and he's saying, I don't want you out of this. I'm, yeah, but God, I don't think I can take any more of this. He says, yes, you can. And I'll get you out when I'm ready. It's real easy for me to say for you to pray thy will be done, but I am really under heavy, heavy burden and heavy trials. Boy, you have to learn that. That's something you have to learn. So praying, how long does it take you to learn to pray? Oh, man, that takes... I have people come here after they listen to predestination, after they hear how that God's ordained everything, and they'll come here and they'll say, I don't know how to pray anymore. And I love to hear somebody pray. God, it's me again. I don't know what to say. Uh, uh, just help us, God. Crush us. Uh, amen. I say, good. That's a good prayer. Instead of... Oh, dear Heavenly Father, we come before thee this morning to show off. That's not prayer. That's not prayer. That's arrogance. That's pride. There's enough, there's enough sin in that prayer to send you to hell. Now, if you don't repent... We're talking about predestination. What are we predestined to? We've been talking about this. People say, you keep talking about this. I've been on this subject of predestination for 18 years on Wednesday night. And we've kind of switched it out to Sunday morning. Mary said, I think the Sunday morning need, people need to hear about predestination. For those of you who had not been here, I know some of you have already heard these things. We'll use for our theme verse, Romans 8 and 29. Don't listen to some of these people who claim when somebody tells you they believe in predestination, they have to define what it is because it has an exact meaning. The scripture says, for whom he did foreknow. God's got a whom that he foreknew. Now God knows everything because he's ordained everything. He knows who will come to him, who won't because he's ordained them to and he has got vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, Romans 9.22. He's got natural brute beasts, which are the vessels of wrath, 2 Peter 2 and 12, natural brute beasts that are made to be taken and destroyed. And these are the same men of Jude 4, men before of old ordained to this condemnation. They're the same people of Proverbs 16 and 4, the Lord hath made all things for himself, Yea, even the wicked for the day of evil. I started to say right where you sit, you're either a vessel of wrath or a vessel of mercy, and there's not one thing you can do about it. People say, but what if somebody wants to come to Christ and they hadn't been elected? You can't have the want to unless you have been elected of God. The will comes from God. When the Bible says born again, Anothen, it means from above. From above. Above, it comes from the word ano, meaning above. You must be born again. You must be born from above. Above, and it comes from the word, word anti, A-N-T-I. And the word anti means in opposition to. Or instead of. You have to have a birth that comes from God that opposes your flesh and it has to be in the place of this flesh and it will fight this flesh the longest day you live. There's an inner man, that's Christ in you, that's the birth in you. And there's an outer man and that's self and you can't get away from that flesh, self, and the inner man can't sin and the outer man can't keep from sinning. Paul said, I have an inner man that serves the law of God and an outer man that serves self. But he's going to burn this outer man up the older you get and the longer you live. And the more fiery trials he puts you through, that's what the fire is for. That's what sickness is for. That's what the Lord said he brought upon Israel for. He said, I'm going to bring pestilence and plague and famine and, and I'm going to bring all this on you until you learn. And he will do this to us and this birth that's going on in you had nothing to do with your will. Nothing. 
Because the scripture says in James 1.18, 1 1.18, of his own will beget he us. We were begotten by the will of God, not by our will. Have you ever seen a child? Is anybody here this morning that when you were born, or right before you conceived by your parents, just before the egg is fertilized by the sperm, you're just about to be conceived and you cry out, wait a minute, somebody give me an invitation. And I want to see if I want to be the son of my, who is going to be my father and my mother that's just about to conceive me. And right before you come out of the womb, you say, wait a minute, somebody's got to sing just as I am and let me see if I want to be born. That's all a lie. That's just not true. You say, who are you to say this with all these preachers saying what they're saying? I am preaching what the preachers were preaching 150 years ago in America. America is apostate. Martin Luther and John Calvin and George Whitfield and Thomas Watson would turn over in their grave if they knew what was going on in this nation. You say, are you the only guy that preaches this? There's a lot of dead guys in my library that preach this. And they loved the truth. And the world is corrupt. Oh, by the way, the invitation hymn comes out of the same thing as Christmas. It's all Roman Catholicism. That's where the Catholics walk down the aisle, kneel down and accept the Eucharist. And they say in the Eucharist, that is the Mass. In the Eucharist, His Christ is the body and, body and blood of Christ. So when they walk down the aisle, they accept the Eucharist or accept Christ. And that was, that was, that was brought out of Roman Catholicism into the Church of England when Henry VIII pulled away from the Church of England and then the Methodist Church pulled away from the Anglican Church or the Church of England and brought that to America in their camp meetings in the early 1800s. And they started walking the aisle and accepting Christ and none of the Protestants were doing that before the early 1800s. Can you believe we've that corrupted? You must be born again. God has to cut into your heart and make you alive. And that's not something you'll do. It's something He'll do in you. And you'll begin to say, Oh Lord, oh God, I feel such conviction. For... And if God doesn't do that to you, you're dead in your sin and you can't bring yourself alive. Now that's what this is about. Anothen means from above. John 1.13, favorite verse. I, that's the verse. I don't know how any free will people get around. I don't understand how they get around this. That Speaking of the new birth from, from the previous verse, that Jesus came into His own. His own received Him not, but as many as received Him, to them gave He the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believed on His name, which were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, <coughs> but of God. We were born by the will of God. And people say, how, do you, how are you saved? How are you born again? Well, you have to believe, but you can't. If God just leaves it up to you, you can't believe Him. If He leaves it up to you, you can't have faith. Why? Well, you're dead. You're dead in your sin. How can you make a life decision? There is none that understands. There is none that seeks after God. How are you going to get to God when nobody seeks Him? When you're dead. I always represent it as, here's a cow pile out here in the middle of a field. I like to represent it that way because that's how disgusting we are before that we come to the knowledge of Christ. Probably worse than a cow pile. You know what a cow pile is, don't you? We're just a piece of cow pile, a dung out in the middle of a field and singing just as I am to a congregation. You might as well go out into a field with a whole bunch of cow piles and start singing just as I... Come on, all you dead people. Bring yourself to life. We were dead in our sin and Paul said we are dung. And you can make yourself alive? You can't do that. 
God has got a people that He's chosen before the world began. And He will cross our path. And if anything comes alive, anything dead, He quickens who He wills. John 5, 21, quicken, Z-O-O-P-O-I-E-O. Isn't this amazing? I'm finding all of these verses and I'm quoting them out of a King James Bible. I've had people say, what sounds like a cult thing you're doing? Quicken, zoopa'eo. It comes from po'eo. That means to make and zoo. Zoo. What is a Zoo. You go and look at living animals. The word zoo means alive. Make alive. He makes alive who he wills. Not who you will. And you don't have the will to come to him because you're dead in your sin and nobody seeks God. So if anybody has the want to, where is the want to going to come from? Where is faith going to come from? Faith is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. My Baptist father, Baptist preacher father would say, for about great, my father didn't know up from down. I won't, I cut no slack for him and I won't cut any for your father for you. The Bible says, for by grace you save through faith. Ephesians 2.8, a favorite Baptist verse. And that not of yourselves, listen to this. By grace you save through faith. And that not of yourselves, Faith is the gift of God. God has to write faith in the hearts of those that are His. Jesus said, all that the Father giveth me shall come to me. But you're not going to come without faith. And the faith has to be written in your heart by God. Everyone here is already a vessel of wrath or a vessel of mercy. If you can hear what I'm saying, if you can understand what I'm saying, you belong to God. If you resent and hate this, you're wasting your time sitting listening to me. What I'm telling you is the truth. What the preachers up and down the streets are saying is a lie. It's a lie according to the Bible. It's a lie according to the church fathers. It's a lie according to the founding fathers. People say, well, why don't anybody else preach this? Well, Paul preached it and Peter preached it and Jesus preached it. I think that's sufficient amount, isn't it? David preached it. In the Psalms, I don't understand why people can't read the Bible and find the verses that I find. They're all over the Bible. Jesus would tell the Pharisees. They'd come to him in John 10. They'd say, How long wilt thou make us to doubt? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. The word plainly is the word parhesia. The Pharisees came to Jesus and said, Be blunt with us. Get blunt with us. Get to the point, Jesus. And Jesus said, I already told you. I already got blunt with you. I told you, you are of your father the devil. The works of your father you will do. I told you that in John 8. And here we are in John 10, and you're saying, tell us plainly, I told you your father is Satan? And the works of your father you'll do, and I didn't invite you in? He said, you will not believe because you are not of my sheep. You're not in the fold. You don't belong to me. Get away from me. Why didn't he say, Peter, come up here and let's sing just as I am. And I'd like to plead with you to accept me as your personal Savior. There's no such thing. Y'all realize how corrupt the churches are in America? And I hear it every day. And my, you say, that, Jim, that's just because you never, you never experienced this. Are you kidding? My father leaned over the pulpit so many times and said, If you don't know tonight, this may be your last opportunity. And we're going to sing one more verse of Just As I Am. I know we've been here 45 minutes singing uh, Just As I Am. And we're just going to sing another 10 verses of Softly and Tenderly. And you may die and go to hell tonight. Man, my father would say that and I'd run down the aisle every time he said that because I believed him. Until I started studying the Bible as I was growing up, and I thought, this is not true. God cuts into that. You can say that to a little kid or to a baby sheep, and they're going to believe you. If you're at some authority in a pulpit, and you tell some little kid that loves Jesus all of a sudden, how do you know? You don't know. Well, I will, well, he's not grown up enough to know. 
And that is bullying the sheep. And that is hurting the little flock and the little lambs. And you ought to be ashamed of yourself. I mean, Jamar, do you tell, your, do you tell Isaiah, you little boy? I say, I may not be your father. How do you know I'm your father? If you'll say that enough, you'll have him crying over there in the corner. <laughs> won't you? That is wrong. You're not supposed to be doing that to poor little baby sheep. Now, we're predestined to something, aren't we? The people, the homes he foreknew. Romans 8 and 29. Whom he foreknew. Not who God knew would walk down an aisle. That's not what it says. And everybody wants to get around predestination by saying, well, God knew what would happen. Well, yes, that's exactly right. He knew what would happen if he left us alone. Since there's none righteous, and all men drink iniquity like water, and none seeks after God, he knew that if he left us all alone, nobody would come to him. He knew that. And if he does not come in and intervene in our lives, nobody's coming. If he doesn't write, what really amazes me, God says he's going to write his word upon fleshy tables of our heart there in 2 Corinthians, the third chapter, those first four verses. I'm going to write this in your heart. You mean that has to do with your will when he writes it in your heart? That don't have anything to do with your will. He's got a family. He writes it in your heart. He arranges your life to cross the preaching of the gospel and when you hear the real truth, it cuts into you and you realize what a low-down slug and sinner you are. And then you start saying, oh God. Then you start calling upon Him. But how shall they call on Him in whom they've not believed? Oh yes, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Romans 10, 13. But how are you going to call if you don't believe in a God? And how are you going to believe when you're just dead in your sin. You can't, can you? Now, predestination is about doing something. Not what he foreknew. Whom? Whom is a pronoun? It's a plural pronoun, and it's talking about a specific particular people. The people, the church, that God foreknew. The wife, the bride that God foreknew, the sheep that God foreknew, those are the ones. Forno, prognosco, P R O G I N O S K O. Prognosco means to know intimately beforehand. The sheep that God knew intimately in his mind before the world began, those are the ones that he's predestinated. And predestinate, whether anybody likes it or not, is the word prohorizo. That's the word, and it has a meaning. It doesn't mean God wants everybody to be saved. It's not what it means. Well, I thought John 3.16 says God loves everybody in the world. No, it doesn't. It doesn't say that. God so loved the world. So is an adverb, and it puts a condition on loved. I put it in big letters up there so you can understand. So, completely puts a whole different meaning upon the word John 3.16. It doesn't say God loved everybody in the world. It doesn't say that. It says God in this fashion. Huta is the word. It means in this fashion, loved. It doesn't say world. It says cosmos. The orderly arrangement of mankind. And it doesn't say whosoever. That's not the words in the original text. It says that the all. That's the word, that's the word they translated to whosoever. Isn't that a crazy translation? The all. Pos, pos ho. Or pos. Oops, wait a minute. That's, pos ho. A paso like that. Paso. The all. The all. The all. The is singular. All is singular. And it doesn't say the all that believes in him. Believe, whosoever believeth, 
Believeth is a participle. A participle is an adjective. A participle in the English is an ing word. Is an ing. So let's translate this the way it should be. A participle being an adjective modifies nouns and pronouns. And this participle, believing, modifies all since all is a pronoun. What this actually says is the believing all. The is an adjective. Believing is an adjective. The and believing both modify all. The believing all. It is a particular, singular believing all. That be These are the ones will not perish but have everlasting life. God's got a particular people and family that he knew. And it's not the way the world is saying. What really amazes me. If God is God, is He God? Can He do everything He wants to? Why did He make the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and put it in the garden? Why did He do that? Why did He make hell? Why did He not make hell? Why did He just not put a tree of knowledge of good and evil in the garden? And why did He have, why did He have Michael and Gabriel And made them perfect where they couldn't sin. And why did he make Satan with a glitch? Huh? Where he would sin. Why did he do that? He wanted the sin to happen. For the same reason that the Bible says that Jesus was the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. That our names were written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. He was merciful to His elect before the world began. And if He didn't make Satan with a glitch, maybe Satan wouldn't have fallen. Maybe Adam wouldn't have sinned. And then Jesus would have wasted His time dying for us before the world began, wouldn't He? God's arranged it all. So whenever he makes Gabriel and Michael perfect, well, is he going to be able to make you and I in perfection where we can't sin? When we're taken out of here to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord, and he changes our bodies in the moment into twinkling of an eye, and he's going to make our bodies to be like unto his glorious body, according to the working where he's able to subdue all things to himself. When he does that and changes our bodies, is he going to give us bodies that can't sin? Huh? Do you think he knew how to make Satan with a body that couldn't sin? Do you think he knew how to make Adam with a body that couldn't sin? Why did he make him with a body that could sin? That was his program and his plan. People say, God didn't want sin to happen. Certainly he did. He's not a sinner. But the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him. God, who subjects that same man in hope. The creature was made subject to vanity, but not by the will of the creature, but by the will of God, who subjects the same in hope. The world's not preaching this. God wanted Adam to sin, because he had a family that he had chosen before the world began, and he wants to redeem us out of sin. How can we re be redeemed out of sin and him be merciful to us before the world began on a cross? How can he do that if we don't go into sin? That's amazing, isn't it? Did God want the tree in the garden? Why? It would make men sin. Why didn't God just forget that tree and forget the sinful nature and say, from now on, Adam, you're going to be perfect and it wasn't a choice for Adam. He said, Adam, thou shalt not, and when you do, you're going to die. Not if you do, but the day you eat thereof, you'll die. This is all about, but predestination is not about this, what some people call fatalism. It is fatalism, but it's not fatalism in the sense of, well, it don't matter what we do then. 
predestination is about what you do. It's about what you do because the word predestinate, prohorizo, is about the light. What is light? Truth. He that doeth the truth. John 3, 21. He that doeth truth cometh to the light. And prohorizo means pro, before. This is the word predestinate. Pro is our word prefix pre. It means before. Horizo is our word. That little mark there is a diacritical mark. It's a breathing sound. It's actually H-O-R-I-Z-O. And later on the end was added by the Latins. It's our word horizon. Predestinate means to predetermine for the horizon. The horizon is where the light shines, isn't it? And Jesus said, "Ye were darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. We have been pre-lightened. And didn't Jesus say, I am the way, the truth. I am the light of the world. Well, when you see light, you can, you can substitute truth, Jesus. We have been pre jesus And you make that a word, jesus He is a jesus man. We've been pre jesus haven't we? We've been predetermined for the light or for Jesus. Well, the people that God foreknew, He predestined to something. Now, the last... I've been around predestinationists. I've been around Calvinists. Don't call me a Calvinist. Calvinists don't believe enough of predestination to suit me. See, I believe God creates evil. He said He did. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all things. I did a paper with dozens and dozens of verses where God says He'll bring evil upon Jerusalem. He'll bring evil upon Babylon. He'll cause the, the uh, Persians to come in and slaughter Babylon and rape the children, rape the women and, and pull the bellies out of the women and destroy them. God says, I'll do that. Over and over and over again in the Old Testament. It's amazing to me that preachers can read these verses and not see what I'm seeing in it. God says, I'll do this. People say, God wouldn't do that. He says, yes, I will. And I'll kill you in eternity when you start arguing with me. Now, I keep saying this. Predestination is about what God has determined for our lives. It's about righteousness. It's about godliness. Righteousness is not going to come in your life if God doesn't determine it. And if God doesn't determine righteousness, you don't belong to God. Righteousness is always equated with the white robes of the saints, isn't it? The Bible says that the righteousness is the white robes. Well, the Bible says you have to do righteousness. Do righteous. There in 1 John 3 and 7. Be not deceived. He that doeth righteousness is righteous. You have to do righteousness. But righteousness is the white robes of the saints, isn't it? White robes. And that's what the wife had to wear when she was taken out by the bridegroom. She had to be wearing white robes. And how are our robes made white? How do we receive righteousness? Which is the white robes? That's the blood of Christ. Are you washed in the blood, in the soul, cleansing blood of the Lamb? And nobody knows what it means. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And nobody knows what that means. We sang that in the little Baptist church where my father passed when I was a kid. I had no idea. What do you mean washing in the blood? A blood baptism. A blood baptism in the first century. Huh? Who? Oh, the old writers knew. Blood baptism was a martyrdom. And baptized, 
does not mean you can't get it from any scholar in the world. Baptized does not mean to immerse in anything. It has the idea of a fluid coming from an outer source. It's an infinitive, a verbal noun. A fluid coming from an outer source and washing someone and staining and dyeing it. It was a dyer's term in the first century. It was a household term, baptizo. Was a household term in the first century. Baptizo meant to cover and baptize. Baptism comes from the word baptizo and babto, and babto means to stain and die. To stain. Our righteousness is what we do, and when we do righteousness, we're going to go through a blood baptism. When, when Jesus said, Can you be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with? He was telling James and John, Can you die the martyr's death? If you don't believe this, you're going to hell. And people will look at this and be stubborn and say, I haven't been taught that all my life in my churches, and I just don't believe that. Your preacher's been lying to you. I wrote my sister a letter, and I said, Janice, Daddy lied to us. Whether he meant to, that's neither here nor there. He did because he did not find out what the truth was. Too many people say, I think God wants me to preach. I, I'm just going to be a preacher. You know, I thought of this last week. I was at the church and the preacher said, if you, God's calling you to preach, and I think I need to preach this week. No, you don't. You go out and study for about 25 years first. And then they get out there and they start shouting something that they heard from that preacher and that preacher started when he didn't know nothing and he heard this preacher over here who didn't know nothing and it goes back one generation after the other and they ever have studied the word of God and this is how all of these opinions get out here in the world. Boy, we are in trouble, aren't we? America's in trouble. This nation is corrupt to the core. The preachers are corrupt. These preachers don't know the truth. They don't study. I've spent 51 years studying the Bible. I can tell you when a man knows something or not. And I've had a lot of years of sin just like you. But I can tell you when I know something. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. What comes out of a mouth is what's in this man's heart. If all a man wants to talk about is himself and his things and his stuff and how big a building he's going to build and his car and his investments... I stood in the church one time here in Hendersonville and this preacher said, you know, I need to really get to invest in a bunch of houses. I need to do something for my kids when they go to college and I need, and it's a humongous church and I'm thinking, don't you have enough to do here without getting out here in the investment world? I thought, what foolishness. And he didn't study, he said nothing. He was very stupid. He didn't have time to study but he needed to go make investments. He said to me one time, he said, I'm just too busy administrating to study. Ha ha, guilty as charged. That's what's wrong. Preachers don't study. They don't, they don't know how to study. They don't have a desire to study. If you have a desire to study, you will study. If you have a desire to learn. You want, there's a difference in this real Boy, I just got saved last week and I'm ready to go preach and tell the world about Jesus. And you get wound up and you get real emotional. You can't, you have to wait till that winds down till the rut gets deep and long and you've been in it for years and you say, now I really want to still study. Not because I feel good, not because I'm emotionally stirred up, but because I know this is what I need to be doing. You fulfill your duty and your responsibility because it's what you're supposed to do. Feeling good is for a short time. You have to know what you're supposed to do. Get down and study the Word of God and get into it. Now, we're predestined, pre-bound for the light. All the predestinationists and the Calvinists I ever heard, they say, whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate, and they put a period right there. They just end. He predestined, so therefore God's got his family chosen, and they're predestined, and forget the rest of the verse. No. We are predestined. 
predestinate, that is called an aorist indicative verb in the Greek. You say, I don't know what an aorist indicative verb is. I'm fixing to tell you. It's a past tense verb. That means our predestination was before the world began. It's past tense. So before the world began, here is what God predetermined for us. Whom He did foreknow, He also did predestinate, and here is what we're predestined unto. To be conformed to the image of His Son that we be the firstborn. Not that Christ is the firstborn, that we be the firstborn among many brethren. We've been predestined to be conformed to the image. To be conformed. Well, evidently we're not conforming. Isn't that right? Evidently, when you, come to, when you first come to a knowledge of truth and you hear some preacher read a verse or you hear some truth being taught, and I don't hear much of it going on, I don't know how in the world people are going to get convicted, but when you hear, when you hear the Word of God, you come to a knowledge of Christ and you're born again. I've said this so many times. When one of you riding down the road in the car, has anybody been riding down the road in the car and heard some preacher and all of a sudden you got convicted in the car? Are you sitting around your house listening to the radio and some preacher preaches and that's the first time you get convicted? Or somebody drags you out here to listen to this crazy Jim Brown and that's the first time you get convicted? Huh? Well, well that's kind of like... Now this is what people do. And this is how we have been so polluted in this nation. You're riding down the road. You hear a preacher read something out of the Bible. You've never been convicted in your life. And here you are riding on Main Street in your car. Okay? And you got your... That's, a, that's an SUV, isn't it? Trying to make it a Mercedes or something up there. Okay, now that's an SUV, and you and your antenna's up, and some signal is coming in from some station, and you hear, and you're driving along, sitting there in your car. There you are, sitting in your car, and all of a sudden you hear this on the radio, your heart gets convicted. You go, "Oh man, oh," and you start believing. Where did that belief come from? Did you conjure it up? Did you write it there? But the, here's what the guy does. He's been hearing his wife talking about going to church and getting saved. So he's been more or less brainwashed to an attitude in America that people have to go somewhere to get saved. So he drives home, goes down this street, comes down here to his house down here, and he comes in the driveway and he goes in the house and he says, Honey, I need to go to church and get saved. And they get up the next Sunday morning and they go up to this church down here with this big tall steeple. Okay. There's a church. And they go in that church and then the preacher gives an invitation to him. He walks down the aisle and prays the sinner's prayer and says, I want to accept Christ as my Savior. And that's all a waste of time. Because the work and the birth began right there. The Bible doesn't say, go home and tell your wife, I need to go get saved. That's where the birth began. The rest is just a journey. This is where the confusion begins when he walks the aisle and tries to accept Christ. And my father kept saying that and I kept walking the aisle and walking the aisle. And I got so confused. Because before he started giving invitation hymns, as a little boy, I was always praying to God and I believed God. And where did that belief come from? I found out later on that God put it in my heart, but I had no idea where it came from when I was a little boy. 
And I was praying at 6 and 7 and 8 and saying, Jesus, I love you. And I can't go out on a playground and cuss with them other boys or tell those dirty jokes. And, Lord, I feel so uncomfortable and I don't know what to do about it. I, I just, and I was talking to the Lord and praying and believing in Him. And if you ask me at six years old who Jesus was, I'd tell you, He's my Savior and He died for my sin. And then Daddy started preaching when I was 10. He started giving him invitation to him, telling me I had to get saved and pray a sinner's prayer. And he started confusing me. And this man is going to be confused because of that experience right here rather than just his belief in God while he's in that car. And that belief, God writes it in his heart and he begins to believe. It's not something you do. It's something God does in you. And do you think he arranged for that man to be riding in that car at that spot? And do you think that he arranged for him to turn that radio on so he would hear and it would cut into his heart? That going home and telling, honey, I got to go get saved. No, you don't. The process has begun. And saved is the word sozo. It means to be taken one point all the way to another point and you can forget that church on the way. You know why I'm so upset at this? Daddy kept me so confused. I was so mixed up as a little kid. I just, and I'd say, there's my sister Janice, and she's two years younger than me. And there's Clyde, and he's two years older than me. There's the idiot Dean over there and <laughs> running around making noise. And, and there's Clyde, he got it together one time, and Janice got it. But I can't get it together. I got to walk down again and make sure I got it right, and I got to keep accepting Christ, keep praying this prayer, and hoping I'm doing it right. All it is is confusing. It has nothing to do with how you feel. Do you believe God? If you do, you'll believe what I'm saying. And if you want to argue with the truth, you don't believe God. You can't believe God outside of this book. It's not, well, I believe God, and you think that book says that, and I think it says something else. One of us is lying. There's not two truths. Not, there's not two algebras. There's not two English courses. There's not two different ways to look at chemistry. You can't say, I have my chemistry and you have yours. When I put this acid in this acid, it doesn't explode. When you put the same acid in acid, it explodes. No, it does it every time. Is that crazy? Now, we are predestined. What we are predestined to. We are predestined to be conformed to the image that we be the firstborn. Now when it says that we might be the firstborn among many brethren, might is not in the text. That's a maybe. There's no such thing as a maybe. When you look in the original text, that's not there. It says we're predestined to be conformed to the image that we be the firstborn. Boy, that's a long subject there. To be conformed, sumorphos. Sumorphos, image, icon. Icon. Sumorphos comes from sum and morphe. And morphe means to shape. Here's what we're predestined to. We're placed in the light to conform us to Christ's image. When I said a while ago... You're born again. That man in that car is born again. But that doesn't mean his life is together. There he is. There's the conception right there in the form of that dot. That's called, when you first come to the knowledge of Christ, knowledge of truth, that's called a new birth, and it's called a little faith. Most, only gospistas, O-L-I-G-O-S, P-I-S-T-I-S, Oligos means puny. This is the way you start. Puny faith. That's what you got. And faith works, doesn't it? Faith worketh by agape. Faith works by love. Over there in Galatians. And faith without works is dead. So what you do when you start off? You've got puny faith or puny works for Christ. And we're not talking about good deeds and we're not talking about ritual. We're talking about the works that God has ordained us to. For we are His workmanship. Ephesians 2.10 
We are His workmanship. Poema. P-O-I-E-M-A. We are His workmanship. Comes from the word poeo. P-O-I-E-O. That word poeo means to make or to do. We are His workmanship. We are His making and His doing. We're His doing. He's doing us in the truth. We are His workmanship. The work means fabric. Or a tapestry. When you look at a tapestry, do you think it made itself? You see some big beautiful weaving and say, Oh, look at that. It did that to itself. Somebody invited it to one day and it said, Oh, okay, I'll weave me. That's what we're saying, isn't it? When you say, well, I accepted Christ and I did it myself. No, you don't. And a weaving doesn't weave itself. That reminds me of the word kashab. Kashab is a Hebrew word that has the basic same meaning as an arrangement, a tapestry that's woven together. That's the word that Joseph used. When his brothers came to him there in the 50th chapter of Genesis, and his brothers come to Egypt, and Joseph is second in Egypt, and his brothers come to him in fear. Jacob has just died. And they think Jacob's death is going to cause Joseph, they think the only reason Joseph, as the prince of Egypt, has withheld his hand of wrath against them is because their father was alive. And they say, and they come to him. Here's all of his older brothers saying, Joseph, now our father said before he died for you not to be angry with us and, and not to kill us or hurt us. They were lying. They still weren't strong. And Joseph turned to him and said, Am I in the place of God? He said, All this evil you did? He said, You, you thought evil against me. But God meant it for good. When you sold me, when you got jealous of me, over there in the 37th chapter of Genesis, you got jealous because I had those dreams? And then you sold me into Egypt? And then I was sold into Potiphar's house? And then Potiphar's wife tries to seduce me? Because God made Joseph real good looking. And he made her good looking enough for Joseph to be tempted by her. And Joseph said, all of this evil that I was sold into Potiphar's house, Potiphar's wife tried to seduce me, then she lied, then I was put in prison, and then I interpret the, the Pharaoh's dreams for the baker and for the cupbearer, and then they're taken out, the cupbearer's taken out of prison like I prophesied, and then the baker is hung and killed as a, tra as a traitor, and then, the, and then I tell the I tell the butler, don't forget me when you get before Pharaoh. And he did. That was also arranged. So that when, so that when the Pharaoh has some dreams, the butler can say, oh yes, I remember. There's one of these children of Israel that's over here in prison. And they say he's got the ability to interpret dreams. And the Pharaoh says, bring him to me. And Joseph says, You've had a dream about good ears of corn, bad ears of corn. You had a dream about the kind going down into the river, Ill, a good favored kind going into the river, cattle coming up out of the other side of the river, ill favored. He said these are the same dream, seven good years, seven bad years. And he said, all of this, he said, you meant it for evil. God raised me up in Egypt to save much people alive. He said, you meant it for evil. God meant everything that happened for good. And that word meant is the word kashab. It means to weave together like a tapestry. Joseph said, "You God wove all of your evil doings together because it was ordained by him that you would do that so you could get me over here into Egypt. Actually, he brought me into Egypt. God meant it for good and God did it. And people say, there's no arrangement of God. And they don't believe in predestination. What foolishness. Now, 
we are God's workmanship. And we start off as puny, we have puny works because we have puny faith and faith works. We start off, majority of what we are, we start off not conforming when we are brand new believers. And you don't conform overnight. You, God has beat me up. I've tried to be a star. I've tried to be a world famous gospel singer. I've tried to be a world famous pop singer. I've tried to be a big real estate mogul. I've tried to do all these things. And I was real good at most of it. But even when you're good at it, God stops you dead in your tracks when you're elect. If you think you can get by living for yourself, we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. And that's what predestination is about. We're going to conform to this poema, to this kashab that God is doing in our lives. It's an arrangement. You're going to do it if you belong to Him. If you don't belong to Him, you're not going to do it. You're not even going to believe what I'm saying. You're going to say, that guy's a fanatic and he's nuts. For some reason, people think because they hadn't heard of me, I started yesterday. I wasn't born yesterday or the day before. I've been around a long time. I started off trying to be a singing star in 1962. It was a long time ago, wasn't it? Man, I'd been to hell and back by 1962. I thought I couldn't live through 1967, 68, and 69. I thought, this is all hell that's falling around me. God, why you let me? Why you put me here? And you know what 1969 is to me right now? It's a feather that somebody's dropping on the floor. I thank God that I went through that. I couldn't be who I am if I hadn't gone through that. And my life fell to pieces in the late 70s. I laid in the bed dying in 1977. Or 74, 75. Then I tried to start my life again in 77, 78. Went back out in the music world. And then at 39, 40, quit that, went into real estate. Started being a hot shot. Then God stopped me about six years later. Stuck me on my deathbed again in Hendersonville Hospital. Said, you, you don't listen, do you? <laughs> it's not like... It's not like I'm a beginner. By 1970, I had traveled all over America. By 1970, I had traveled in churches in Washington State, all over California, New Mexico, Arizona, Colorado, Nebraska, Kansas, Iowa, Minnesota, all over the South, all over Alabama, Georgia. I don't even remember the places I preached. Can't even remember just preachers' faces and names just flying through. God had to crush me in my mid my early forties, mid forties, to make me preach what I'm preaching. I didn't come up one day. I think I said, "Think I'll let me see if I can just be a real nut and make all the world think I'm out of my mind." Just get up one morning and say, "I think I'll be masochistic somehow and just see if I can flagellate my body with humankind." Come on, everybody, get me. To preach this message, you have to be either out of your mind or it has to be true. You don't do nothing but make enemies except for the elect. And that's few. When you preach this. You did all that for us, but... Well, I did it for the elect, but I didn't do it. God did it through me, so I'll be here teaching you. That's why he did. I wasn't supposed to be a star. I was supposed to be here telling you the truth. And I wouldn't be here telling you the truth if I was somewhere singing to 20,000 people last night, would I? No. Besides that, that's a waste of time. You know that stardom is a waste of time. Stars are jerks. Did y'all know that? I've been around a lot of them. I know them. They're fools. They think there's somebody. Besides that... People who were famous 30 years ago, nobody knows who they are. People who were world famous. I always use the illustration of the... I was down at Dillard's one day and I was listening to the background and I could hear... I recognized it was the fifth dimension. 
I looked over at the little girl across the counter. I said, you ever heard of the fifth dimension? And she said, I don't think so. She's a little girl to me. She's 22 or 23. No, I don't. I, don't. I said, that's them right there coming over that music sound. I said, they were so famous in 1970, they could pack entire coliseums by themselves. And you don't even know who they are. Isn't fame fleeting? <laughs> and they fell apart and went nowhere, and now they're, ain't no telling, maybe one of them's working in some store out in Los Angeles. I had a favorite group called the Coasters when I was in high school. One of my favorite groups back in 56. 57, they sang Charlie Brown and Along Game Jones and funny songs, you know, a lot of funny things. I liked them. And I was in high school and turn up. We didn't have boom boxes, but I had a 49 shivel and I'd turn that thing up real loud and I'd cruise around downtown and around the pig stand. See, y'all think y'all started that? You didn't start that. And, my, and the thing wouldn't turn up high, but I'd just turn up as high as it'd go and I thought I was cool and I'd put my elbow over there on the... On, on the now they come up behind me going, foom, foom. I'm, hey, can you turn that up? I can't hear it. <laughs> Sometimes I'll say that. But I know how they feel. It's like Bill Cosby said. They take their music with them. They think they're cool, you know. I got my music with me, you know. Cool is kind of dumb. I don't know if y'all figure The old people know that by now. Uh, cool is dumb. Cool, cool is when you think you're smart and you don't know nothing. <laughs> what got me there? I don't know. All right. When you start off, you got little faith or little works. Most of what you've got in you, and we've been talking about this, most of what you've got in you, what is it? It's you. It's you. All you got is you. You got self. You're filled with... Now, this is the believer. If God's going to conform us to the image of Christ... That's because when you first come, you got little faith, and you got more of you than you got anything else. You got contention, strife. What else you got? Envy. We've already gone through these verses. You got envy, you got jealousy, you got busybodying. Now, this is what the Bible says is in every one of us. You're busybody. You're froward. Yeah, Argo. Argos. <laughs> you're slothful. Slothful. And that's because you're idle, the Bible says. The Bible says over there in the fifth chapter of First Timothy that you're a busybody. When you're a busybody, you're slothful. That means if the word is idle, idle, the word is Argos, it means lazy. You're lazy. You won't work. What this means is you won't work for God and you won't conform to His image. So God's got to work on that outer man. Paul says in Romans 7, I've got an inner man and I have an outer man and God's got to work on this outer man. You say, Jim, why do you stay on this subject so long? I've got so many things we need to understand about this. Everything that God's doing in the life of the believer is about getting rid of this outer man. Everything in the Bible that's about righteousness that you have to do. He that doeth righteousness. All the truth that you have to do. He that doeth the truth. You have to do or you don't belong to God. If you want to continue, we've had so many people come through here. I've had people in the music business. They won't quit traveling with pagans. I've had people that work on jobs. They won't quit. And Dwayne knows this. Boy, that's hard, isn't it? Dwayne's a songwriter. Boy, it is so hard. And that's a fever. That's a disease that gets hold of you and just can't hardly let go of it. Butch, my old guitar player, comes. He says, Jim, it's so hard. I don't know what to do. I've been in this so long. It's all I know, playing guitar. It's real easy to say to a man, well, stop that. I can't even tell somebody what to do. I'll just say, hey, wrestle with this. But it's not just musicians that have the problem. 
we all have jobs that say, I can't quit my job now. Everybody cusses on my job and they rant and they rave and they carol and they run around on their wives and their truck drivers. And <laughs> Truck driving is a tough, tough business, isn't it, Jim? I mean, whew. you can watch the TV Discovery and they'll talk about truckers and they're out there killing people and they're out there on drugs and they got prostitutes in every one of the truck stops and they're running down the roads and they're tempting these truckers and saying, stop over here and, and we'll have a little tryst in your truck. And it's like the temptation, it's something you have to fight every day. This is a battle that we're all in. And don't say, well, I conquered it. I got saved. No, you haven't. Paul said, oh, wretched man that I am. Not, oh, wretched man that I was. He said, when I do the things that I would not, it's no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. He said, I want to do right, but I can't do right. How to perform that which is good, I don't even find in me. The apostle Paul, who is a writer of 14 books of the New Testament, one more or less, he said, I can't even find goodness in myself. But most people who talk about Christianity don't understand. Predestination is the process of coming out of that old man and God just literally taking over. And it takes fire and tribulation and trials and sickness and bankruptcies. And God said, all these things work together for your good in everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. You're supposed to be thankful as it happens. If you belong to God, He is molding you. He is conforming you to His image and He's getting rid of the old man. He's got to get rid of us, doesn't He? Because we've got a man in us that won't quit sinning. 1 John 1 and 8 says, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And His truth is not in us. 1 John 3 and 9 says, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he's born of God. What is he talking about? You can't keep from sinning, but you can't sin. He's talking about that inner and that outer man. That inner man can't sin. The outer man can't quit. But the inner man is going to insist that the outer man take his cross and die daily, isn't he? The outer man, the inner man insists... Not He's not asking you, would you like to die? Would you like to put to death self and the idleness of self that will not work for God? He's not asking you if you want to do that. He's saying, if any man will come after me, deny, take and follow. Deny self, take your cross and follow me. And those are imperative commands in the Greek and you can't get around it. We're not going to get around it. We're going to die. And if you're not dying somewhere in your life, and self is not being eliminated. And this strife and contention in you. Has anybody here had any strife or contention? Does anybody stress out? Does anybody here get mad in traffic? Does anybody here get mad and somebody beat you out of money? Does anybody here have a problem when you get stressed over bills and you can't and you're behind on your rent? Does anybody get stressed? You're not supposed to. First of all, you're supposed to readjust your life where you can live on what you're bringing in. Not trying to keep up with the Joneses next door down the street. We're not supposed to do that. And God's working on this man. We are predestined to be conformed. Sumorphos. Morphe means to be shaped. Sum means to be in fellowship. This don't mean find some church and go to it. The only fellowship that we are allowed is the fellowship of His suffering. We're supposed to withdraw from the world. That's part of God's doing, isn't it? Isn't that part of God's doing? We're going to be conformed to the likeness, to the icon, the likeness of Jesus. Jesus said, I came to do the will of my Father, not my will, but His will. If we're going to be like Jesus... We're working for ourselves in our strife, in our contention, our jealousy, our worry. God's going to teach you not to do that. Now, you might be 60, 65 years old by the time He gets you there. And you may be right in the middle of the journey right now, but be, be of good faith. Be assured that's of God. What you're going through is what you're supposed to go through. Because God is shaping us into His image, so we'll be the firstborn. 
The firstborn in the Old Testament. That was the one who was supposed to be the priesthood. Priesthood. That's who the priesthood was supposed to be. But God substituted for Reuben, who was unstable as water. Reuben was the firstborn of Jacob, but he was unstable. He did some sin that we won't get into right now. So God said, give me the Levites. Levi was the third son of Jacob. And God said, I want you to buy back the firstborn. Well, that's what he paid for at Passover, didn't he? So the firstborn wouldn't buy, he pla- wouldn't, wouldn't die. They placed the blood upon the doorpost. In the doorpost of the, in the, and the doorways, the threshold was the original altar. That's where they offered the sacrifices. So Reuben is not the, is not the priest of God. The Levites were. They are the shadow. Shadow. The firstborn was supposed to be, but now God has a firstborn. And that's us. God has predestined us to be the priesthood of God. We are a royal priesthood, aren't we? What do priests do? They offer acceptable sacrifice. I beseech you therefore, brethren, Romans 12 and 1, by the mercies of God that you give your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is the only reasonable thing you can do, which is your reasonable, your logikos, L-O-G-I-K-O-S. That's the word reasonable. We get our word logical from that. And it comes from the word logos. Logos is the word, word. It's our word service. It's the logical thing we can do. If Jesus died for us, we are priests of God. We are to die daily. That's the sacrifice we give. How do you die daily? How does a man die daily? Huh? You deny self. You, right now, I'm dying. Because you tell the truth. When Jesus told the truth, He died for it. I'm telling the truth. And what I'm saying is so erratic from what they're saying at the Big Baptist Church and the Big Church of Christ and up here at the Devil's Broadcasting Network, DBN. What I'm saying is off the wall for what you'll hear. And you know why people don't believe me? Well, I've got a real sharp, shrill voice. I'm wearing jeans. And I got on this Hawaiian type shirt. Don't have any premature gray hair. And I'm not saying big, round, profound words. So therefore, how can that guy have the truth? Huh? Do you think that determines whether something is true or not, what somebody looks like, that's what the world does. They look at the outward appearance and God looks at the heart. Listen to what a man is saying. Don't listen to his round, profound, smooth words. That doesn't mean a thing, does it? We are predestined. This is the whole point. We're predestined since we're not conforming, since we're so involved in ourselves has anybody here been involved in themselves besides me or would everybody here like to lie to me? Everybody's been involved in themselves. When you fight for your way, when you fight for your rights on your job, Jesus didn't do that, did he? They murdered Jesus. Jesus was innocent. He was God. And he was innocent. And when you kill an innocent man, that's murder. Murder. But the murder of Jesus was predestined by God, according to Acts 4.28. Herod was there, Pilate was there, the Jews were there, the Romans were there, and they were therefore to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel, determine before to be done. Determine before is the word prohorizo. The, the death of Jesus was predestinated by God. They did their evil will, and they did the will of God. Boy, that's a hard thing to get a hold of, isn't it? And God didn't sin when he caused them to kill Jesus. God's not a sinner. God's not under the law. We're under the law. He can kill who he wants to when he gets ready. Can he? 
20 and 24. Okay. Well, let's look at it. Proverbs 20. All right. A man's goings are of the Lord. How can a man then understand his own way? You can't understand it. It's all ordained by God. We make our plans, and God directs our steps. If you look over there in Psalms, in uh, Proverbs 16, in Proverbs 16 and 9, a man's heart deviseth his way. You make your plans. I made all my plans when I was young to be somebody and to be a star and get a lot of applause and lots of recognition and make the world like me. I wanted to be popular. But the Lord directed my steps and he made me unpopular and made me stand up here and preach this thing that makes people mad at me and think I'm nuts. <laughs> what? This is not what I planned. Lord, I planned for everybody to like me. He said, I know that, but you're not going to get your way. You're going to make everybody think you're crazy. <laughs> Tell them Christmas is pagan and Easter is pagan. And Easter is the end of Mardi Gras. And Mardi Gras and Easter are the same thing. And I don't have time to go there. And that predestination is true and everybody don't have a chance. And God's got certain people that are vessels of mercy. And they will hear and vessels of wrath won't hear. And you have to take your cross and die daily. And if you don't, you're going to hell one day. You cannot go to heaven without what I'm talking about. Predestination is the only way to heaven. Because if God doesn't preordain you to conform, if we're going to be like Jesus, aren't we going to walk in the narrow way? The way to heaven, the narrow way, narrow is the word thalibo, T-H-L-I-B-O. There in Matthew 7, 13, predestination. I got a t-shirt that I had made. It says, predestination, my favorite subject. And then I got under it in small letters, it's the only way to heaven. And it is. Because predestination is the method that God's preordained in us to be like Christ-like. And you can't go to heaven without that. That is the way to heaven. The way is narrow, isn't it? Well, when you go through tribulation, narrow is the way that leads to righteousness, and few there be that find it. That word thalibo, the base word is thalipsis, T-H-L-I-P-S-I-S. And that word thalipsis, every time you find the word tribulation, Jesus said, in the world you shall have tribulation, in John 16, 33. Paul said, we must through much tribulation enter the kingdom of God, then Acts 14, 22. Well, when you go through tribulation, that's what's conforming you to the likeness of Christ. Predestination is being conformed to the likeness of Jesus, and the way there is through tribulation, through the narrow way. Predestination is the only way to heaven. God's got to preordain a family because we were all dead. Somebody tell me how dead men can make himself alive. If you believe that... Next time you go to a loved one's funeral, and you get to the funeral home, and everybody's saying they're dead, all oh, they're crying, say, I can stop all this crying real quick. I'm going to sing Just As I Am and get this guy to get up out of the casket. Just as, come on, I know you've got enough life in you to make a decision to come alive. You say, why are you making fun of those songs? Those invitation hymns drove me out of my mind because I couldn't get it fixed and I wanted Jesus so bad. You want him bad enough, you're going to find out. Walk in the aisle, don't do it. Praying a prayer, don't do it. If God doesn't change your heart and turn you into another person, you're not going. Unless you're willing to go against your family, the world, Another thing I preach here that people don't like, you have to become enemies of your family. You have to separate from the world, don't you? How much time do I have, Mike? Look here. Give you a couple of verses. If we're going to be like Christ, are we going to do what He says? Huh? Well, let's look at a couple of verses. I meant to get into this earlier. Look over here in 2 Thessalonians. <laughs> Did Jesus write this word? Is He the living word? Yes. Isn't it the written word of God? 
if we're going to do and be, if we're going to be the priests of God, being like Christ, ordained to be like Him, we're going to do what He says do, aren't we? I think the hardest message I preach, harder than Christmas is pagan, harder than Easter is pagan, harder than predestination, which this is part of predestination, is separating from the world. People don't believe they have to separate from the world. And I'm not talking about quit your job. I mean, when you're on your job, don't eat with them, don't run with them, don't fellowship with them, be polite, be cordial to people, find believers, and I'm not talking about people who go to a Baptist church or a Pentecostal church or a church of Christ. Find true believers in the Word of God and fellowship with them. Come to Grace and Truth Ministries and fellowship daily with people here. Get to be friends with these people. Go to dinner with them. But the Bible says we're not to fellowship with people who won't walk according to the Word of God. In 2 Thessalonians 3 and 6, Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw. Abstain from associating with is the word stello, S-T-E-L-L-O. Abstain from associating yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly and not after the tradition which he received from us. Now why would you do that? Look at verse 14. Here's why. If a person is elect and they're a true believer, when you separate from them, they will think about this. It might take them six months or a year or two. They'll think about this and they'll begin to get convicted. Look at verse 14. And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man and have no company with him. And the reason is, is the last phrase, that he may be ashamed. Yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. If they're really true believers, their hearts will be convicted. Look over here in Ephesians. Ephesians 5. Paul says that we're to walk in love in verse 2. As Christ has loved us, love is agape there. Agape is walking in His commandments. And His commandments are more than the Ten Commandments. It's every time He gives us a command in the New Testament. And He says... But fornication, verse 3, and all uncleanness and covetousness, let it not once be named among you as become of saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talking, nor jesting. I like the word jesting, eutrapelia. E-U-T-R-A-P-E-L-E-I-A. That means an easy turning of the head, always joking. I don't like for people to joke all the time. We laugh and we'll say things funny things, but I get back to the truth real quick. Jesse Duplantis is a false teacher and a liar. And God doesn't want us up there being jokesters. He needs to sell his suits and get him a clown suit and move to Las Vegas. That's what this is talking about. Which are not convenient, not proper or fit is what the word means, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know that no whoremonger nor unclean person nor covetous man who is an idolater. Covetous, pleonectes, there means to want more. Stay away from people who all they want to do is want more. P-L-E-O-N. E-K-T-E-S. They're always wanting more than what they've got. And all they do is talk about themselves. The man that speaks of himself seeks his own glory, Jesus said in John 7, 18. Hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God? Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. Don't fellowship with these people. For you, you were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is of all goodness and righteousness and truth. Hang around people who believe in the fruit of the Spirit, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather rebuke them. 
And it's talking about people who are into all this false doctrine that he's talking about before. Isn't it? I know, and I've said this to some of you, many of you, I know you're weak. And inevitably, when I bring these verses up, after church, people say, you talking to me? Yeah, I guess. <laughs> if, the, if the shoe fits, wear it. I'm talking to all of us. I can't be there and be your strength. Everybody, I said this to the lady the other night, everybody has to go out and test the waters. After you really come into the truth, has anybody here been back to a church where you used to go? No. Huh? no. Well, some have tried it once or twice. And after you go, does it seem, you start going, you go, what is this? You go, it's like, oh man, I had no idea I was in this much error. I've gone back, and I've tested the waters. You're going, oh God, I didn't know this was this bad. Because your ear is tuned in to the truth, and you didn't have any idea how bad it was while you were there. A brutal reminder is watching these characters on TV. Yep, it is a brutal reminder, isn't it? I've got so many more of these, I'm running out of time. But look over here. Look over here in 1 Corinthians, the 5th chapter. There's a man having an affair with his stepmother at Corinth. You say, how can a man do such a thing? Corinth was a very apostate church. It is, it is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication is not so much as named among the Gentiles, in verse 1, that one should have his father's wife there at Corinth. And you're puffed up, and you haven't mourned over this sin in the church that he hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. Separate from that man. Tell him, we don't want you in the church if you're going to live like this. I've got a guy that comes here once in a while. And I've called him out from the pulpit. I kept calling him down. He says, well, I sleep with women and I drink, I drink and I get drunk and I take drugs. And, I, and he walked right up here when he comes here and says, yeah, I'm still drinking and sleeping with all these women and, and I'm still taking drugs and I'm still cussing and still... But at least I'm, I'm confessing it. I said, that's not confessing. Confessing, confessing your sin, <coughs> admitting it. He was admitting it. He thinks that's confessing it. I don't know why you want everything to do with me. I'm confessing it. I'm still doing it. Confessing it is agreeing with God, homo legato, that you have to change. I, and I tell him, when he walks up to me, if you ever seen him come in, he's the guy with the ponytail. I said, I'm not having anything to do with you. I called him down from the pulpit on one of the messages. I said, don't have anything to do with this man. The Bible says, take him before the church. He lives wild. He says it. and He wants to come in here and be our buddy and our pal. I'm not talking about it. We've all got sin, but we're talking about presumptuous sin. Planned sin. David said, deliver me from presumptuous sin. Presumptuous sin is you're just sitting against the light and saying, I can do this. God said, anybody that's doing that, disfellowship with them. And he said, this man, he said in verse 5, deliver such in one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord was the day when God came to deal with the man. That doesn't mean the end of time. That means when God's whipping this man, Turn him over to Satan was an idiom in the first century. It meant to separate, execrate him from the church. Don't sit around patting him on the back while he's in his sin because he'll say, I'm okay, when God comes to deal with him. You're not supposed to be patting him on the back. But, that's, and but you say, but my way seems better. This makes people mad at me. <laughs> Believe it or not, God's way is better. If you're going to be like Christ, we have to do this. And look here what he says. He says, your glory is not good. Don't you know that a little leaven, which is a type of sin, that's this man coming into the church, leaveneth the whole lump, and it'll, and it'll go throughout the church. You'll start putting your approval on him, and he'll start affecting you. You'll start doing some things he's doing. Purge out therefore the old leaven, that you may be a new lump. As ye are unleavened, for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep 
the feast of the spiritual Passover daily. Not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, like this man, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with fornicators of this world. He's saying, I'm not just talking about literal fornicators, I'm talking about spiritual fornicators. And spiritual fornication is going after other doctrine. I don't even have time to go out there because I'm nearly out of time. That's other doctrine. Or with, he says, yet not altogether with literal fornicators of this world, or with covetous, which is wanting more. Don't hang around people. All they want to do is talk about what they want. Or extortioners, or idolaters, and the idolatry we get involved in is self. Or them, then must you needs go out of the world. And now I have written unto you not to keep company if any man is called a brother. He said, even if a man calls himself a Christian, if he calls himself a brother and he's a fornicator, a spiritual fornicator, he's going after other doctrine or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such an one, don't even sit down and eat with him. Well, it's hard, isn't it? With such an one, no not to eat. Well, what's that have to do with false doctrine? Am I out of time? Huh? Yeah. Second John 10. If anyone comes bringing any other doctrine, do not receive them into your house, neither bid them Godspeed. Godspeed means to be cheerful to them and take them into your circle of friends. If you bid them Godspeed, you are partaker of their evil deeds and you will partake of their, their judgments. You say, Jim, I'm just a baby and all this is too much. I can't handle this all at once. I know that. When you have trouble... Hang around us and we'll be here to help guide you. I'm always here for you. Just call me on the phone. People call me. We're on TV in about 36 cities and people call and I answer the phone. I can't believe I got you on the phone. You heard you on TV and you answer the phone. I said, you called from me, didn't you? They said, yeah, what do you need? And I talk to people long distance all the time. The only way you can learn these things is to be around the people of God. The only thing that's going to shape you into the likeness of Jesus is the fellowship of other people who believe in this suffering for Christ. They believe in this outrageous doctrine we preach. And do y'all realize that what I preach is outrageous compared to what you can get in a Baptist church, a, a Church of Christ, a Pentecostal church, a Charismatic church? This is outrageous. It sounds crazy, doesn't it? Yeah, I got have, I have me a, people always saying, you still listen to that Jim Brown all the time. So I had me a shirt made. It says cult leader on the front. And it's got that Jim Brown on the back. I'm not as mean out of the pulpit. Well, I get on fire in the pulpit when I think about all the false doctrine that's going on in the world. Let's pray. Father, thank you for truth. God help us. This is so hard living by your word. You said if the righteous scarcely be saved with great difficulty, where would these ungodly and sinners appear before you? This is hard sometimes. We don't know how to do it. You said it's supposed to be a tribulation narrow way. Teach us that, that we have to get into this trench. It's a battle to the death. And we can't put this cross down till we die. Deal with our hearts. Crush us under your hand. You said we have to be.